For today's episode, I'm bringing on one of our all-time most popular guests. He's an SEO expert, and together we'll be discussing all the ways search has recently changed and what to expect through the rest of 2024 and into 2025. We'll touch on SGE, EEAT, we'll talk about the rise of multimodal search and whether or not we should be thinking about optimizing for large language models. And we'll also talk specifically about Reddit, which is just burst in popularity since Google is surfacing Reddit more and more in the results that they show. There's lots of tips, so whether you are struggling with your organic traffic or you're just thinking about how to change your SEO strategy for the rest of 2024 and beyond, this is a great episode to listen to. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I am super pumped to welcome back two-time guest, Kyle Roof. <laughs> Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's, I'm proud to be a repeat guest. Yeah, and not only are you a repeat guest, but you are one of the most popular guests I've ever had on the show. So mm-hmm. you're like a groundbreaker. You're, a, mm-hmm. you know charting Thank really you so off. much. Thank <laughs> you so much. I appreciate that. Well, it speaks to uh, your experience and wisdom on all things SEO, such a hot topic for marketers. Um, so I have so many questions for you today. I'm, I'm really excited to just, just pepper you with them. Uh, but first, I thought just to give everybody a little bit of context, if they didn't hear your previous episode, which by the way, I'll put in the show notes. Uh, You have three companies that you have either founded or co-founded. It's High Voltage SEO, which is an agency, yes? Correct, yeah. Internet Marketing Gold and Page Optimizer Pro, which is a product. So um, if you would, just maybe give me your elevator pitch on all three of those so everybody knows what you have going on. Uh, the agency, we have offices in Phoenix, Berlin, Melbourne, and now in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh-huh. And uh, we're multinational, multilingual, uh, uh, multilanguage. We do local to national to international, everything in between. Um, out of the agency, uh, basically came the other two companies. The Page Optimizer Pro is an on-page SEO tool. And it was just, we were doing it internally. <laughs> and um we were doing it by hand and then we realized that wasn't scalable. So then we turned it into a script and then we kept breaking Google Sheets and then we turned it into a SaaS type product that we were just using internally. And I showed some friends, would you be interested in this? And they said, yes, I would be interested in that. And so then it became its own its own thing as a completely separate entity from the, from the agency. And then uh, IMG, Internet Marketing Gold, is courses. Um, so we teach SEO. I think we have like 45 courses in there now. Wow. Um, wow. Maybe even like 50 covering all different aspects of SEO and my courses in there on um, on page SEO and white hat SEO are two of my popular ones there, but kind of like every little different angle on SEO is probably covered in there. And then we also run tests on Google's algorithm and uh, publish the tests there. Um, I would like to say that it, it was like a, a Machiavellian plan where I would have the synergy between these companies, but it, it really wasn't a master plan, but it did come together really well. Cause what I realized is we kind of touch people wherever they're at with SEO. If they want to learn how to do it, if they want to go do it, if they need somebody to do it for them and all also like different price points or different levels of involvement. So the three companies work extremely well together and then we can market across multiple channels. And then kind of once we get you into our sphere, we probably have something that we can provide. Yeah. So I like that because right. Small companies can uh, operate off the same budget as, yeah. as larger ones. So having something for everyone, because everyone needs SEO right. help for sure. Um, and internet marketing gold or IMG, it's a consortium, right? There's, there's lots of SEO experts within that. Am I correct? That's right. So each, uh, um, so of the, 
we have 50, 45 or 50 courses and probably 43 instructors. So very few instructors have two courses. It's mostly one course for one instructor. And so you can kind of get a lot of different opinions about it. You can see from a lot of angles and, and then um, covering all aspects, you know, your on-page stuff, your content marketing, link building, all the way through like running an agency, uh, affiliate sites, finding niches, that kind of stuff. It's all in there. Wow. And, and you mentioned that you guys uh, do testing on Google's algorithm. And so how does that work? Can, can someone pay you to run tests or are you testing it yourself for your own knowledge that then you turn around and offer through consulting and things like that? Most of the tests from that I run, or I think other people who publish their tests there as well, it comes out of a need, you know, a, a need to know the answer to a question. You know, should we do this or that? Well, what's going on with this? Or we heard that. And so they're all pretty practical. Uh, initially, when we launched IMG, it was just the tests. And I realized that while people like that, and it does give us a level of credibility, at the end of the day, they want to really learn how to do SEO. And so I think the tests kind of are great because you do kind of learn what's going on right now. And you do kind of, it also kind of gives you like a BS meter as to when you see something like, I don't know, I've seen these tests over here and I don't think that, or they're like, oh yeah, that actually sounds right. So it kind of allows you to kind of filter things out. So we've got that for, for that purpose. And you kind of learn about what's going on with SEO. And, and actually if people want to participate, they can run their own tests as well. Um, oh, okay. We, uh, yeah, we have a little testing group within the group essentially. Nice. Um, but, nice. Yeah, it's fun. A testing mastermind. No. <laughs> That's right. Uh, right. well, let's, let's dive right in. If you don't mind, I have so many questions to ask you. Uh, but, but first like, okay, so you were on the show two plus years ago. What, you know, what's, what's happened? What kind of changes have we <laughs> seen in the past couple of years? And maybe more importantly, why did these changes occur? Sure. Um, so obviously AI has been on everybody's mind. That's been the that's been the biggest thing. I don't think that's impacted SEO as much as people thought that it would. Um, within the search and within the SERPs, you do see like the, the generative type stuff, which is them pulling information out and putting it uh, in, in a different location. But when it comes to doing SEO, um, you can't push an AI button and get SEO done for you. It doesn't know how to do SEO. It really what it does is it, it allows you to do things faster. And what I've noticed though is that SEOs who are bad at SEO, it just allows them to do bad SEO faster. <laughs> like it's not, you know, it doesn't like rescue their, their SEO strategies because it doesn't know SEO strategy. Uh, a good way to use it is, is in content creation, getting that first draft. Um, within the agency, you know, we, we create a lot of, say, supporting content, kind of second tier content. Yeah. Uh, in our workflow, we would often, previously we, we, we had a team in the Philippines and we would get content from them and that would go to a native English speaking editor and then they would be edited and out. Essentially, we've kind of replaced that team with AI because what you would get from that team and what you get from AI is about 70% the way there, but still mm -hmm. needs to be edited for like brand and tone and voice uh, accuracy because AI can hallucinate and uh, lies quite a bit. Uh, but then it goes to the human editor there. So you can use it a lot, I think, just to uh, streamline your content, uh, generate content ideas, generate, um, you know, uh, a social media plan for what you're going to, to post for uh, a month or three months or something like that. It allows you to do those kind of things, but it doesn't necessarily replace doing SEO because it, it does not know how to do SEO. Yeah. And creating the content is still downstream from that, not only that business and content strategy, but that SEO strategy as well, right? That's right. Um, yeah. It, it's it's on the speed up the process to get the content outside of things than, than the actual doing the SEO type of thing. Yeah. Okay. So what else has changed? Um, while EAT has been on everybody's mind as well, uh, last year, Google did update their uh, quality rater guidelines. And within that update, um, the E's are expertise, uh, experience, uh, um, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And they have a little diagram where they have like three circles and you have the E, E, and the A, and then there's a giant one on top of that that's the T for trustworthiness or trust. They basically said that's the most important thing. If you if they can't establish the trust factor, the other things don't uh, matter at all. Essentially, what they're looking to do is should they have this site in the index in the first place? Should you know should it be there? Like, uh, and it comes down to who is responsible for the website and who is responsible for the content. You know, essentially, if somebody uh, buys something or somebody follows this advice or they do something and they need help, can they get help from that site? 
And so um, those types of factors that you can demonstrate to a bot that you, that you have that ability uh, to be a real thing, that you can demonstrate that you are a legitimate business and that these are humans or they're people behind this, this company and then they're writing it. That's the kind of stuff that you need to demonstrate. And if you can, then you can kind of pass that trust threshold and then probably else, everything else is just fine. Um, that has been a big part of what people are talking about and, and sites that try to hide that. I've definitely had problems over the last five, six years. Google's very hostile to these types of sites and they continue to be hostile. And you can see that in what they're doing with these guidelines. But then in addition to that, this last year was the helpful content update the HCU update, which came out in September and October, which really impacted SEO. That's that's impacted SEO much larger than anything that I've seen ever. And that uh, sites that um, are excellent sites doing great content just got completely destroyed, losing 50, 60, 70 plus percent of their traffic essentially overnight. It's been pretty brutal. Why? It'd be, uh, why would that be? If they're extremely good websites, it seems like they would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> what made them uh, unhelpful? <laughs> my favorite example is a friend of mine runs, I think, the like third largest travel site that isn't part of a conglomerate, like not part of Condé Nast, for example. And um, the content they put out is put is done by people who are in those locations. And so, like this one article is like the fifty thing, the fifty best things to do in Seattle, written by somebody born and raised in Seattle, and she wrote this beautiful article. Well, they got moved down off of the number one spot and the site is, I think it's a Reddit post, but the number one thing now to do in Seattle is meth. Like that's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> and, then it, and, then, and then it gets less savory from there on the list of things that uh, the person is suggesting to do in Seattle. So not exactly helpful no. content. So but, what, I guess, what was the logic or the underlying, I don't even know if algorithm is the right word to use towards how Google is surfacing things and on others. I know it's AI driven, but also still an algorithm. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, let's, let's put a pin in that for one, one second and get okay. on, on the idea of that algorithm. But yeah. uh, I do think this ties back into that issue of trust again, and that, um, there's this concept, if you look at the no-no list in Google on what you can and can't do, there's a thing called a doorway page. A doorway page is a page that ranks for keywords and then funnels you somewhere else to, to convert. Mm -hmm. And essentially that's what um, affiliate sites are or sites that do this type of thing, uh, like that, that best of uh, things to do in Seattle, essentially that you get to that site and you cannot convert on that page if you go to click to say buy a tour package or uh, you know airplane tickets or something like that. You and you go somewhere else. Essentially, you're funneled to another site to complete um, the conversion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the definition of a, of a doorway page. And so I think, again, with Google's hostility towards um, these types of sites, that they would prefer to have a site that's responsible for the actual sale. Uh, I think this was an easy way for them to find these types of sites and remove them in mass. Uh, and the problem is I don't think they've replaced it with anything better necessarily, yeah, but I think they've, like this is how they've targeted these types of sites. Yeah. Um, that idea isn't totally mine. Uh, Kazra Dash, <laughs> who works from Searcheru, that's that's his investigative work. But um, mm -hmm. I really, I think it ties into what we were just talking about with Eat and kind of yeah. what Google's trying to do uh, and and the sites they would prefer to show up in the SERPs um, rather than then rather than the sites, the uh, the affiliate sites or the niche sites or the the, the kind of best of roundup type sites. What about the pillar pages? So, so the idea of that long swirling page on a B2B website that, that still links within your own property, your own website. So it's linking to blogs, linking to white papers, all of that stuff, but it's still a landing page of sorts. It's still a gateway to get you somewhere else. Are those still a good strategy? If they're, if they're staying within your site, I think they're, they're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's the, um, uh, staying within your site is the key, not getting funneled uh, to Amazon, you know, to, to buy a product and convert over there. Yeah. Okay. How about author authority? How much um, importance is now weighing on that with EAT? So I don't think any. Because <laughs> oh, okay. um, Google isn't in the value judgment game. They're not trying to decide, uh, you know, is a degree from Stanford better or a degree from MIT? Uh, who knows? You know, is it better to have a degree and no experience or 20 years of experience, but you didn't graduate high school. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, and I don't think Google wants to try to make that, um, that valuation, but what they do want to try to see is that it's a real person. Mm 
Yeah. And so the authority comes from demonstrating that it's an actual human that's here that, and that's why it's a good idea to have like your social profiles linking something. I don't think Google's going to go click and read your, you know, your, your resume on LinkedIn. Right, like, oh, okay. right. To make a judgment call on how authoritative yeah. is that authority? I guess in my mind, is it important to have the same author across you know, in a technical industry publication and on an industry association and on a blog and, you know, presenting at an event that's on a website, just popping up in multiple locations under the same topic or theme. I like that. Um, but again, because it, it's more of a signal to show that this is an actual person that's done these things. Yeah. Not, not that they're necessarily an expert, but then the, the, the expertise is then implied by that because they've done those things. Okay. You know, but it's not, it's not that they uh, evaluation was sometimes like those things exist. Therefore, this is probably somebody that has some form of authority. Yeah. So we talked about avoiding to a certain extent, external links to help with eat. What are some other ways to optimize under this new, new world that Google has thrust us into? Well, something you can do uh, on, on the eat side is the links acts, a, aspect of it would be links coming into your site. Mm -hmm. um, showing uh, consistency with your brand name, with your address, with your phone number, with the description of the business. And so uh, one extra thing you can add to that is make sure that your citations are correct. You're in uh, the general citations for businesses, and they're also an industry specific citation. Citations are basically business directories uh, that you're getting links from those ones that are the most important ones for your particular brand or your, your niche. Uh, get into those would be an, another solid step to um, try to protect yourself uh, from eat checks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, and what simple advice to do. And I bet lots of companies haven't really focused on that. Like no one's going to go to Google right. business page to find me, you know, I sell electronic components or something, but this is, this is just a basic thing to go claim for exactly. an SEO reason. Right? And, and it just shows that you're real. It is as many signals as you can give a robot. John Mulaney's got a great joke and he says, you know, you spend the majority of your day proving to a robot, you're not a robot. You know, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and can I ask a robot for advice? And you said, no, yeah. the robot can't tell you how to fool the robot. <laughs> exactly. But so it's like those kind of things that you have to prove to the robot that you're real. You know, you have to yeah. prove to the algorithm, the algorithm that you're real. And as much as that is, you can do the better. <laughs> Well, moving on to SGE, so search generative experience from Google. Also, we've been in the beta program for the past year or so, so we've been watching it evolve and, you know, have been uh, uh, completely upset at some versions and then only to watch, oh, okay, attribution's back, it was gone, but now it's back and, sure. you know, all, all kinds of iterations. And last I read SGE is being beta tested now in 120 countries. So it sounds like we're getting close to it launching. Uh, what have you heard? What do you think of it? What should people expect? Um, I, I think it's going to be very similar to featured snippets when those came out. The featured snippet is a, a, an answer box at the top of a, of a SERP that you know has, has maybe the question that you asked Google and then gives a, a snippet of an answer uh, from a page. I think it's, it's going to be similar to that. It's going to, it will take some traffic. There will be uh, a traffic haircut, but I think you ultimately do want to be in those areas because it kind of it kind of adds like a second layer of optimization to what you're doing. So you optimize first to get onto page one, and you optimize second to get into those little special areas that are generated by AI. I think and it looks like the, the special areas are really small. Yeah, <laughs> in the and, last version. And it also, I really it, it it's it's bothersome where Google really says like you know don't take somebody else's content and then all they're doing is just taking other people's content yeah. and <laughs> posting yeah. it on there, which is a little frustrating. But um, I think what you're really going to want to focus on is good semantic order, which you should have anyway. So that's like having an H1 for your title and an H2 for your subsections and H3 for your inside subsections. And you don't use H tags for anything else on the page other than those things. A lot of people will often use H tags for design because they can get the font the size that they want. I think uh -huh. that's a mistake. Avoid that as much as you can. Just okay. use CSS, you know, change the font size, but be very intentional with your H tags because the generative AI is going to come in and it's going to try to read this as well as it can. You need to make it as easy as possible. 
yeah. and have it nicely structured for the AI to quickly uh, understand what this is about, if it's going to be the information yeah. that it's looking for. This blog post yeah. is not about Helvetica or Arial or <laughs> Calibri, right? right? No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. But that it, it's very clear through the subheadings that you could, just like with an outline to like an essay, you could read the, the subheadings, understand what that essay is about. Yeah. Same kind of a thing. Okay. And when SGE is pushed out, will it be the only way or will it be an option? Do you think? Well, that's a good question. Like they give you a way to turn it off from like the mm -hmm. Chrome browser. And people are like, I don't that. want this. <laughs> you can't turn off featured snippets. Uh, True. You can't, I don't think, I don't think I've ever seen a feature that you can turn off. Yeah. yeah like so the, probably like the, we're going to be stuck with it when it, when it shows, whenever it shows. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Okay. I think so. It'll be there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so we have all these, so let's think broader than just Google, right? Uh, so we have Gemini, we, we have SGE, chat GPT, you know, we can go on, there's the Claude, the list is long. What about optimization for those things? So the, the semantic order will be big for those. The other thing for your content will be, um, entities. So, um, things, being able and concepts, you know, a person, place, an object, an event, an organization, but then also kind of what the concept is, uh, making sure that um, that it's clear through that uh, that entity structure that you're putting uh, within your your site that it, it it's clearly about this particular thing. It kind of goes hand in hand with the with the subheadings. You know, are you actually hitting this correctly so that a bot that's coming in or an AI that's coming in and it's really just pulling out these words and it's kind of shaking them around and <laughs> they kind of looking at them. Can it understand that as easy as possible? And I think um, you can use something like Google's NLP API and it's, it'll pull out the entities that it identifies on the page and uh, also the category that it thinks that your content is. And I think it's a bit of a sanity check uh, to make sure that you've written within what Google is expecting. But that kind of thing will be, I think, an important check as you do your content to make sure that the entities that Google's expecting are on that page, that the category you provided is, is the category that Google's expecting. Okay. Uh, and I think that that'll, I think, encourage um, the, the AIs to understand what, what you're trying to do and, and help you get into those areas. Yeah. It, um, if I'm not mistaken, my impression is with large language models that the more your brand is mentioned in association with X across the world, you know, across the inner interwebs, if you will, uh, the more likely it is that you'll show up. So it's a volume game right now, not a quality or trustworthy game. But that that'll change over time, perhaps, you know, to be smarter, like Google's trying to do to make it more credible. And instead of just the Yahtzee, you know, let's throw some words in the can. <laughs> Maybe this is just wishful thinking on my part. But what what are your what's your reaction? It's an interesting, it's an interesting idea, um, because if your brand shows up within the corpus of documents that it's used to be trained on, it might be more comfortable with you and it might give you uh, a level of trust because it's familiar with who you are. And, and I, I could see that. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. I like it. i yeah. go with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't heard of anybody like, let's go train all the LLMs. Let's just go load all our documents so that they know us. Like, um, you know, it's not a bad it, idea. Yeah. It seems to me in the short term, the bigger brands with vast websites with lots of links are just going to naturally win out. Yeah. Um, but maybe because by default they're going to have more information that's within yeah. those language models, right? Right. The thing is, here's my here's my controversial take. Um, I bet this time next year it'll be a completely different model. I don't think the models that they have right now are going to achieve what they want them to achieve, and because I think right now it's kind of just like a a, a fun parlor trick, more than you know, like yeah. more than the dream of what they want it to be. Because it's not AI. There's nothing. Uh, intelligent about this. It's not creating anything new. It's not thinking on its own. It's not coming up with anything. Um, it's a lot of it is just, I mean, it's a, a predictive model on the words that it thinks should come next. Yeah. And I don't know that that's going to get things as far as they want it to go. So I bet this time next year, it's either a completely different language model or a completely different thing rather mm -hmm. than the, the models that we're seeing right now. So I wouldn't fall in love too much with this as I think it will change. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I and I so, don't feel like that's controversial at all. I I hope <laughs> that you're right. I'm with you. I support that position. So uh, maybe we need to have you next year at this time so we can play yeah, we this do. clip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clip yeah, where we are. I was very wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the other trend we're seeing is multimodal search, and so mm -hmm. people aren't just now de by default going to Google, although they still have what their ninety you know, 90, whatever percent yeah. market share, they're going other places, they're starting their search in other places. So how much should marketers spend thinking about optimizing for YouTube or Reddit or, you know, what, what recommendations do you have there? So I put Reddit into a different category. Uh, Reddit would fall into something called Parasite SEO. Parasite SEO is where you put content on another site and use that site's authority to rank. So something like a Reddit or a Quora or Medium are three kind of big examples. You should be doing that. It's ranking very well right now. Your brand should be doing that. Um, there are times when you can win keywords that you don't deserve to win. You know, you shouldn't be winning that term, but you've got a, a Reddit post or, or uh, something on Medium that is ranking for it. And so that should be something that you are uh, pursuing aggressively. Um, and, and I would highly recommend doing that in, in this certain, in this search climate right now. And Reddit in particular, all of a sudden, Google just fell in love with Reddit. What was the that, catalyst that, that behind came, that? That came from the, the helpful content update. When uh, that update hit, Reddit and Quora were the big winners. They moved up into those spots and pushed a lot of people down. Because they That's were exactly, considered helpful and trustworthy from actual people? My my thought is because there is, a, a in a way, fact-checking through um, the people that are there. Essentially, that they're upvote or downvote. Mm -hmm. uh, comments and, and content so that the group can decide this is more trustworthy than that. Uh, so then Google doesn't have to do the value judgment we talked about. The value Reddit's judgment exists. Doing it for them and Core is doing it's, it for it's there. them. And then you as the consumer can go through and read and you can then decide if you like this evaluation that's happened, but it's done there in public. And so that's why I think they prefer those sites. And that's why I think within that update, why those other sites dropped and these sites moved up. Wow. If I'm listing and I, if I'm listening to this and I own a community website, it sounds like from what you just said, a great little feature would have upvoting so that you can have yeah. that reaction and that helps boost even more potentially. hundred percent. And I'd really make sure though, that Google can read that content. Uh, sometimes uh, people will block Google from, from reading that. Uh, or the the plugin or the feature that they're using to create that might not be not allowed by default. Google yeah, to crawl into it. So, protected and it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, let Google reread it because I think it, I think it can give you an edge. Okay, great advice. Okay, so then what about YouTube? Yeah, so then something like YouTube and TikTok. I don't think Google is losing market share to Bing or anybody else, even though um, you know Bing came out with uh, the the generative stuff first and. It was nifty, but nobody went and used Bing. And mm -hmm. Bing is just going to, I think, stay where they're at. Where I think Google will lose market share too is YouTube, which is also owned by Google. But uh, YouTube and then uh, Instagram or or a TikTok, those kind of places where you're right. I think people do, some people do go and search because they get a, a personalized response in the sense of like, if I went like things to do in Scotland, I'm going to get something that's personalized towards the travel videos that I've already seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it might give me things that I actually might want to do. That's where I think they might lose market share. So from just a marketing perspective, I think, are my users there? And if they are, then that's the kind of thing that I think you do want to start posting mm -hmm. and, and have a presence on those platforms. Yeah. Okay. What about, um, what are your opinion on directory websites? So I pay to put my company's products on this, you know, industry vertical website. Yeah. Um, if that site is ranking, and it's, it's out, I would do it. Um, something, uh, you know, that's the that's Parasite SEO. Essentially, you're getting your your stuff on there and, and using them to rank and move up higher. Um, in the agency, we only ever optimized one page uh, in earnest for, for the purposes of trying to get clients. Yeah. And it was for um, like SEO agency Berlin or something like that. Uh, we've let it go since, but um, we got to number one and we kept kind of getting bumped down to number two by Clutch, which is a, a review site, right? And so we were like, God damn it. So you know what we did is we just bought the number one spot in Clutch. Yeah. So that way we're either one or two, you know, like if so somebody clicks on, they were in the one spot, they click on us or they go to Clutch and they look, but we're right there again. Right. And that worked pretty well because now we're, we have those two spots and people can see like, oh, Clutch is like endorsing them. So yeah, if you have those opportunities, I would take them if, if 
that page is ranking for the thing you want, you can get your stuff in there and you can maybe move yourself higher, do it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I will say back to your like things to do in Berlin or planning a trip. I, I went straight to Claude or, and Jim and I, yeah. when I, I planning my trip and brainstorm with them, but I will say what I got are the various obvious answers, but it helped me figure out things like transportation and, you know, so. That's what, that's what you'll see with those things is they cannot get specific. They can only give general response. Like if you asked it for the top 10 apps for walking enthusiasts, it might actually be able to give you some apps, but then it's going to say stuff like this app is really great because it's a great app. You know, it's not going to give you like, <laughs> it's not going to give you like features of the app, you know, that yes. you might like. I, I got you. Uh, so uh, if we just, you know, take a step back, there's a lot. Well, before I do that, any other you know, past couple of years, or as we look through to the rest of 2024 and into 2025, what should people have on their radar? Anything else? You know, I say this all the time, just keep it simple. You know, don't worry, you know, like get your content out. The, the only page that can't rank is the page that doesn't exist. So don't get into this like paralysis of like, you know, is it the best of this? Is it going to help with that? Just get it up. You can always tweak it. You can always tweak it from there, but uh, stick to your content schedules, get those going, make sure you're, you're covering the questions that your consumers have. And those are often search terms. You know, people are searching for those kind of things. So make sure that you're answering the questions that people have and, and get that content going, I think you're going to be okay. And when you think about what are people searching, the idea of intent has been discussed a lot lately. So really thinking about the context of that search and how can you double check yourself for intent? <laughs> Here's my unpopular opinion. I, I can't stand intent um, <laughs> because there's actually nothing you have to do. It's simple. Uh -huh. Do the search and look at the pages that Google likes. You know, the, the secret is hiding in plain sight. Google already is doing the intent part for you. And it says, I think this matches the intent. You don't have to try to get in the mind of the consumer. You have to get into the mind of Google. And fortunately, Google shows that to you. You know, it shows you the types of pages that want, and then that's the type of page that you need to give Google. Okay. Uh, we talked about Parasite SEO, which to me kind of sounds like it could be a quick win if someone's not Definitely. participating. Uh, what, what else would you recommend if someone's looking for a quick boost? You know, Parasite SEO is like the number one thing I'd be doing right now. I would find sites that are ranking for the terms that I want. I would also do it for my brand. You know, I would I would um, check out sites that are ranking for my brand because you want to control that the narrative, right, about what you do, who you are. And yeah. so I would make sure that I'm optimizing all those pages that are ranking for my brand. And then I would look at the pages that are ranking for uh, my terms. And I would, I would push that. That's going to be your quickest wins. And especially right now, because they're already ranking or they're doing well, you can probably do get stuff on page one quickly. Yeah. Um, the other thing is just, uh, as I said, make sure you just don't go too far chasing shiny objects. It is, it is easy to start thinking about like, oh, we can do this. We can do that. We can do this. We can do that. Make sure you are at least you're hitting the foundations on things that you aren't trying to out clever yourself or out clever Google, you know, the, you are sticking to the, the basics that, you know, that work, the foundational stuff that works and then build off of that. I think it's very important. When you say the foundational stuff that works. What's the quick gut check on that? Well, uh, when, you know, if you have like a, a longer tail term, so uh, a longer phrase that has lower search volume uh, and should be pretty easy to win. Um, are you hitting those at a good clip? You know, like are, are they actually ranking quickly for those types of things? And if you're finding that you're not, it could be they're more competitive than, than you're anticipating, but it could also be that you're really not, you're missing some of the foundational stuff. Mm -hmm. You're not doing those things that, that should work and push you forward. So I would kind of monitor those easier to win terms. Are you actually winning them? And if you aren't, then you might want to evaluate, you know, what you do as, as kind of your baseline SEO. Yeah. And to look at how competitive um, a term is, is that part of what Page Optimizer Pro does? What Page Optimizer Pro does is uh, we look at what's on page one, you know, the competitors that are winning the term. And then we pull out the terms you need to get on your page, how many times you need them and where you need to place them. So that Google will like your page more. Mm -hmm. So we do like a competitive analysis on uh, page one there, there. And then that's the recommendations we give. So we don't give averages uh, or anything like that. It's, it's um, an actual it's competitive edge analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, um, what are some, you know, just as you think about, okay, marketers listen to all this and they're like, ah, like I'm, things are changing. I'm not sure what to do. Like, um, what's your just parting advice? 
um, things don't change as much as, as you think. And a big reason is that while Google might have the ability to something, they're going to do it in the cheapest way possible. And it's probably the way that they're doing it now. Um, you know, when you think about a bell curve, you know, the stuff, the 10, 15% on either side, that's the stuff that definitely changes, but that middle, you know, 80, 70% really does not change that much. There might be some slightly different approaches, but if you kind of look at the framework you have to do SEO, if it's hitting that middle part, whatever changes come, you're going to be okay because you're understanding the why of what you're doing, not a specific technique, or you're not tied into a specific tool or specific mm -hmm. thing. You're understanding what you're trying to do to get that traffic or get those impressions, which is the main goal of SEO. Uh, it's kind of increase the foot traffic to your site, essentially. Yeah. If you're understanding that, that that's the framework, whatever changes happen, whatever, you're going to be okay. Okay. Be authentic to your brand and what you yeah. offer, but be smart about the technical side of SEO when it comes to some of the things you described earlier. So exactly. I like the bell curve. I, I see that. I, I see it in my head. It's great. <laughs> uh, Kyle, where can people connect with you and learn more about your three businesses? Um, you can go to kyleroof.com. My stuff is there. That's probably the easiest one. And then pageoptimizer.pro. I'm there a lot. IMG.courses there as well. So any of those three would be great. And um, depending on your company size, like you said, you have self-paced, you know, classroom things. You, yeah. you can online training. Uh, you have full service consulting right. and it does that is that also do seo for you or that's right yeah yeah and if you're like newer to seo um within page optimizer pro we actually have like a beginner's academy as well it kind of goes through some basics on this is what this is what we're trying to do you know this is why yeah. we're doing what we're doing and so you can kind of see that perfect all right well thank you so much for your time today kyle thanks for having me i appreciate it thanks for joining me today on content marketing engineered for show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.